for the last couple of years, I've been doing something uh, that I kind of wonder, what, Dean, what took you so long to start doing this? But when I go to bed at night uh, and I'm getting ready to fall asleep, I pray. Now, I've been praying uh, at, at bedtime for a long time, but in the last couple of years, I've been praying um, a prayer that, that we know as, as the Lord's Prayer. It's, uh, that's, that's what we call that, that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. And um, this is a prayer that many uh, contemporary Christians uh, have forgotten um, for whatever reason in our desire to develop a personal relationship with Christ some of us have, have grown uncomfortable at saying a prayer that's written down. Uh, we want to pray the kind of prayers my mother-in-law calls extemporaneous prayers. But Jesus said, um, when you pray, pray like this. And so if he says that this is a good way to pray, then it's a good way to pray. Um, but he also warns us against vain repetition. And uh, maybe, maybe you've grown up in a church that... Uh, prayed repetitive prayers, and uh, maybe that wasn't meaningful to you. Maybe that became very religious. So we want to avoid vain repetition, but we want to pray the way Jesus told us to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray like this. Uh, Say, our Father. And uh, so I've been doing that, and uh, it's it's a prayer that I memorized when I was a child, and I want to encourage you to memorize this if you haven't. Um... And it's also Jesus' command to us. And when we pray that way, we know for sure that we're praying according to the will of God. And the great thing about praying according to the will of God is that we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the requests that we've made of him. And so as I pray, I'll I'll pray one phrase at a time. And I'll kind of meditate on that phrase and I'll reflect on that that phrase. And... um, my meditation on a phrase usually leads me to be specific, either in giving thanks for a specific thing or making a request for a specific thing. Sometimes it leads me to specific confession or even worship uh, guided by different phrases along the way in the Lord's Prayer as I'm, I'm meditating on Jesus' model, model prayer. Well, uh, as some of you know, uh, during... Uh, September and October, I traveled quite a bit. In September, I went to, um, to Medellin, Colombia. We did uh, Ridge to Reading literacy training, and we, we trained some pastors in, in church multiplication. And then I went on down to Ecuador, South America from there, and Gail joined me. And uh, we trained some other church leaders in church multiplication there and uh, did some planning with our, par- our partners in Ecuador. In October... Uh, we went to South Africa by way of, uh, of Germany. Uh, it was nice to get in that time zone quickly and kind of get a, uh, uh, adapted to the time zone. We were in South Africa, and, and Gail and I were there doing training, especially in coaching. Uh, and some of you have benefited from Gail's ministry of coaching, and we were able to take that to Africa. It was very well received. Um, we went on from, from I went from uh, South Africa to India, and to a neighboring country, uh, and then on to Singapore. So, you know, I was doing this thing with the Lord's Prayer, and uh, I, was, I was in India, and it was late, and I was sleepy, and, and I was starting to pray, and I said, uh, Our Father, and I stopped on a word that I don't normally stop on. <laughs> stopped on the very first word of the prayer. Our Father. Whose Father? And I started thinking about all the people um, that I had been with, um, uh, all the people that I had met in Colombia and in Ecuador. And I I started thinking, our Father. And uh, the Colombians are so different from the the indigenous people in Ecuador that I work with. the Colombians that we were working with, urban middle class people, the people we were working with in Ecuador, Highland Quechua people, rural people. Um, the Colombians were exuberant, classic Latino kind of folks, and and the uh, indigenous people are reserved and calm and almost stoic. 
but they all love Jesus. And uh, I started thinking about the people I'd seen, and, and as I was praying, our Father, and the people that I was going to see in my travels. And uh, so here, here's a picture of a, a paisa. Paisa are the people from Medellin, Colombia. And uh, then we were with some Afro-Colombians. And uh, we don't think about Latinos as being uh, Latins and African culture coming together, but they do. And uh, their expression and their way is a little bit different from those people from Medellin, Colombia. And then we were on in, in Ecuador. And I was remembering that our father is the father of these Chimborazo uh, Christians. And I know their story. I'm going to tell you a little bit about their story as a people and how they've come to faith. But not just of the indigenous people in, uh, in Ecuador, the mestizos too. And that their worship is different from the, the Quechua peoples, but he's their father. And then we got to go down to southern Ecuador where Gail and I ministered for 12 years. Um, and I was thinking about the fact our father is the father of the Saraguros. Well, came back here and then, then we went back to the States and then we left for Africa. Had a wonderful time in Africa. It was our regional coordinator seminar. Uh, church planting leaders from all over the continent of Africa came together. And uh, I saw this, this group of three people praying. And uh, it's just such a beautiful picture. Men and women praying together. But uh, our father is, is the father of Korean Christians and the father of Nigerian Christians and even the father of, of Hoosier Christians. And they were praying together there. Togolese people and Congolese people, and he's their father too. And uh, their way of worship, their, their experience with him is different from ours, but he's their father. And then I was in India, and uh, it was a gathering of people from North India and South India. India's got like 10 languages with more than 100 million speakers in each language group. And it's a very diverse country. And we were all there together, worshiping the Lord and he's their father, too. And then I, then I was going on and uh, seeing Bengali people. And, uh, and from there, my last uh, stop before I came back to the States was in Singapore with Tamil people, people who'd come, who'd, whose ancestors lived in India, but then 100 years ago they moved to the Malay Peninsula, and now they live in one of the most prosperous cities in the world in Singapore, and I got to be with them. And so our father... It's a father of all these different people. So when we say our father, it's not just us four and no more. It's all these people all over the world. And as I was reflecting on how many brothers and sisters I have, because if he's our father, they're all my brothers and sisters if I'm God's son. How many brothers and sisters I have and how many different places they live and how they worship in many different ways, but they praise one father. And how they evangelize in many different ways. Uh, the, the different patterns of evangelism that I get to see are just fantastic. And I realize that I'm in this family, and as I reflected on the challenges they face, the challenges they face to follow Christ, the opposition and the persecution that they overcome, and they overcome it by the word of their testimony, the blood of the Lamb, I felt really proud of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I felt really proud uh, that I can call God my Father and that they can call God my Father. And I started thinking, well, how did this all happen? How did it happen that, that uh, people in Medellin, Colombia, and Chimborazos, and Saraguros, and, and Congolese, and Togolese, and Nigerians, and, and uh, South Africans, and, and all these peoples in India, and all these peoples... Uh, the Bengali people and the Tamil people, how did it happen that they all call God Father and that they're all worshiping Him? How did that happen? And, and I started thinking, of, thinking back in history and realized that in all those places that I've been visiting 200 years ago, if I'd been there 200 years ago, if I'd been there in 1815, there wouldn't have been any congregations like the congregations that I got to be a part of. There wouldn't be people joyfully praising their Heavenly Father, sure of their salvation and confident in the work that Christ had done among them. There wouldn't be these churches that were fellowships of believers like this congregation 
only with their own local and culturally appropriate uh, expression of the faith. It wouldn't have been there in 1815. It wouldn't have been there probably in most of the places in 1915. It might not have even been there in 1955. God is doing an amazing thing in our world today. He's calling diverse people to himself. And behold what manner of the love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. And all these people are the children of God, and they're all worshiping our Father. And something dramatic is happening in our world today that hasn't happened in the past. And I get the privilege of traveling, and, and, and I, I make this statement that something dramatic is happening in our world today that has not happened in the past, and I have a real, I'm really frustrated. I like to think of myself as a good communicator, but when I say something dramatic is happening in our world today that's not happened in the past, I, I just feel like people don't understand the truth and the impact of that. And so bear with me in my frustration. And, and I hope that you can, can, can see some of the things that I'm seeing. But God is doing an amazing work. He's calling people uh, to himself. He's calling people to follow him. And, and stuff is different today than it has been in the recent past. God is on the move. And he's, he's inviting us to be his children in Chimborazo province in, in Ecuador, and if you, if you want to see where that is, it's right in the middle of Ecuador in the Andes Mountains. It's named after Mount Chimborazo, uh, a, a mountain that is about 21,000 feet tall, snow-capped Andean mountain. In Chimborazo province of Ecuador, the people lived in spiritual darkness and ignorance, um, mixing pagan Andean beliefs with ritualized Catholicism. And they lived that way for generations and generations from the time of the, the Spanish conquest right up to the 20th century. They celebrated drunken fiestas. And in these drunken fiestas, those Andean beliefs and the fear of the spirit world and um, Catholicism were all mixed together. And alcohol was a part of it. And uh, it was it just, just a disaster. And these fiestas took place on a near monthly basis. Um, the people of Chimborazo province lived their lives of, full of fear, uh, fearing evil spirits, fearing their neighbor, uh, fearful of the landowner for whom they worked who had near absolute power over them, though it wasn't legalized slavery. And in many ways, it was practically slavery. Uh, their landowners saw the, the indigenous people as cheap labor, and is uh, subhuman at best. Um, and, and the Chimborazo people lived anxious about how they would survive in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And this was their existence for generation after generation. In 1912, uh, the first person to live among the, the Chimborazo people to intentionally share the good news of Jesus came to a little town called Colta. In fact, there were two people, they were both ladies, two single women uh, went to live in Colta, and they went to share the gospel of Christ with the, the, the Chimborazos, the good news of salvation, that God loves us, he wants to forgive us, that he wants to live with us and empower us and transform us to give us eternal life and to give us joy and righteousness and peace in this world and also in the world to come. She had that gospel message, they had that gospel message, and they began to, sh to share it with the Chimborazos, and everything that they did seemed to fall on deaf ears. So the two of them lived there for 10 years, from 1912 to 1922, more or less. And then uh, one of them uh, got sick and was not able to continue. And Miss Woods continued on sharing the gospel with the Chimborazo people. And she, she lived there until the early 1950s, so from 19. 12 to about 1952, 40 years sharing the gospel. And at the end of her time there, nobody could really point to a Chimborazo Indian whose life had been transformed by the gospel. She translated the New Testament. They did all sorts of, of health ministry and practical ministry and, and loving people, and yet there was no impact But in the late 1940s and the 1950s, there was land reform in in that part of Ecuador, and people didn't have to work for the large wealthy landowner. Um, 
there, there was a, a gospel radio station that miraculously got a license from, uh, from the Ecuadorian government. And, and pretty soon the gospel started to take hold, and there were a few people whose lives were transformed. And then more and more and more, there was horrible persecution. They would, would beat up the believers, and they would mistreat them because it was a threat to the status quo. Uh, there's one story of people going into a village and, and sharing the gospel, and a, a crowd came against them and grabbed them and took them and threw them over a cliff down about 20 or 30 feet into a bunch of cactus. And the cactus broke their fall. But the amazing thing was that when this guy got up, he didn't have a thorn on him. And people were in shock. And the gospel came into that town. And so in town after town after town, in the 50s and 60s, there was a tremendous movement to God. And people who had lived this life of fear, fear of the spirit world, fear of the large landowners, fear of, of, of one another, began to experience the peace of God and the power of God and the life of God. And they, they began to worship him and, and plant churches and, and churches multiplied rapidly. And so there was this huge, huge transformation. And that's, what's a, what, that's what the gospel does. Uh, that's what the gospel does. And, and they were transformed. If time permitted, I could tell you stories like that from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia. I could tell you story after story after story about how the good news of Jesus came and transform people, and people were free. People who lived in bondage uh, were free, and people who lived in darkness saw a great light, and people who lived in fear are fearful no longer because of the power of, God, of the gospel. It's a gospel that transforms, and it's transforming people all over the world. And this liberation, this freedom, this new life in Christ that people are like the Chimborazos are experiencing is something new and different that is happening in, in, in our world that for years was not happening. And it's happening in a greater way. But it's always it's happening in a greater way now than ever before. Um, it's always costly, though, to share the gospel with, with other people. It's always costly. You need to know that today. It's always costly to share the gospel. We've heard testimonies of people who struggled with fear. And they, and they had to say no to their fear to say yes to speaking the good news. And good things are happening when we share the, when we share the gospel. It's always costly to share the good news of Jesus. It cost Jesus his life. He left heaven above to come and live among us, to be mistreated, to be misunderstood, to be put down, and ultimately to be killed by evil men because he cared enough to share the good news with us. He cared enough to be a sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. And this Miss Woods, who was in, in Chimborazo province, investing 40 years of her life to share the gospel, and 10 years with a, with a, a partner, and 30 years by herself, and it's always costly to share the good news. William Carey was a, a shoemaker in England in the 1700s. And uh, he was a, a member of a Baptist church. And he understood the gospel through the preaching of the Baptists in, in England. And he began to think about the people who lived not in England and not in Europe where the, the focus of Christianity was in the world at that time, but he began to think about people that lived in other places that hadn't heard the gospel. And he began to study and do uh, uh, research on geography, on demographics, and where are the people that need to know Jesus, and what would it take to make Jesus known in the places where he's not known. And he began to get a burden to go to India, and India, of course, was a British colony at that time. And, and so he wanted to go to India because he knew that there were millions there that had never known the love of Christ, that had never known the forgiveness that comes by faith, that had no, never known the freedom of being a child of God. And, and so as he, as he planned and as he wrote, he talked to the leaders of his church. He talked to the elders of his church. And he said, uh, would you send me and would you send others like me to make Jesus known 
among the, the people of India. And the, the el, one, an elder in his church said, sit down, young man. If God wants to save the people of India, he doesn't need to use the likes of you. And that was a message that he got. And yet, in spite of that humiliation, he was able to find some people that, that would send him, and he went. And he was a tent maker. He, he didn't depend on, on support from, from England to do his work. He was a shoemaker. He's a very industrious man. He started agricultural uh, enterprises in India, but he shared the good news, and he began to translate the, the Bible into the Bengali language, and he'd done a tremendous amount of work. And then there was a fire, and the manuscripts that he'd written, translating the scriptures over a period of many years, were burned up in a single night, and he didn't quit. It's always costly to share the good news of Jesus. His wife suffered a horrible psychological torment, and it was just a misery for her to be there and for him to be there, but he didn't quit. It's always costly to share the good news of Jesus. Maybe you've heard of Mary Slessor, who went from England to what is now Nigeria, and she was sharing the good news. And you'd think she might have had, had support from her countrymen in the United Kingdom, but she didn't because they wanted to sell uh, alcohol that was brewed in England. They wanted to, uh, that was um, uh, distilled in England. They wanted to sell it to to the people in Africa who had no ability whatsoever to drink without getting horribly drunk. And she wanted to stand in the way, but they wanted to mow her down so that they could profit from that addicting business, and yet she lived in Africa for years after years, not trusted by the African people, not trusted by the people from her own country, but faithful to the gospel, sharing the good news, building a relationship, a, a woman in a land dominated by men. And today, Nigeria boasts a huge and growing church that lives for the praise of God. It's always costly to share the good news. I could tell you other stories but it's not only costly for the pioneers, it's still costly today. Not just in the, in the 18th century, the 19th century, or the early 20th century. It's still costly today to share the gospel. Evangelists and church planters today face persecution and rejection and threats on their life and threats to their security. But they still go and they still plant churches among lost people. Uh, it was so encouraging for me to hear testimonies from South Asia about Hindu background followers of Jesus sharing the good news with their, with their Muslim neighbors. And you know the world we live in, and you know the religious tensions that we live in, and you know how uh, Islamic fundamentalism has become more and more violent uh, over the last 20 years, and that's certainly true in South Asia as it is in other parts of the country, and yet your brothers and sisters in Christ are sharing the good news. And what a joy it was for me to see uh, some of the fruit of that. What a joy it was for me to go into a room with um, about 19 imams, but not imams uh, who are only uh, basing their teaching on the Quran, but imams who have seen that Jesus the Messiah is the way. And they're learning. And, and each one of these guys leading two or three or four different house churches. And, and the gospel is advancing in amazing ways because somebody paid the price. And somebody said the cost is worth it. Um, still they go. And still they reach lost people. And lost people are born again and churches are planted. But it's always, always um, costly. And all these people confidently pray, our Father. And they know Emmanuel, God with us. Um, but they don't just stop there. They pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. They pray that way. 
not just our Father, they pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what I'm trying to communicate to you is that God is answering that prayer. This prayer that Christians have prayed for thousands of years, God is answering that prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. That prayer is being answered today. Um, people have been praying that for years. And uh, like so many prayers, the answer to that prayer is a result of divine human cooperation. I wish I had time to talk about that, but when we pray, we need to put feet with our prayers. And I encourage you to read the book of Nehemiah, because Nehemiah was a guy that prayed all the time, and he took action in keeping with his prayers. And God worked, and he worked, and he gave glory to God when the work was done. And so it is with our prayers. It's not enough just to pray and to sit back and to, to hope that something good happens. God calls you and me to pray and put feet to our prayers, take action in keeping with God's will to cooperate with God and see, um, see those things answered. Um, Juan Guillermo Cardona is a guy in, in Medellin, Colombia. He leads an effort called Satura Colombia, and uh, it's a partnership between OMS and uh, a lot of churches in Colombia. They had a prayer team in their church that went out and uh, did prayer walking, and they came across some people living under a bridge, people who were addicted to drugs and alcohol, people who earned their living in prostitution, uh, just a disastrous place underneath this bridge. And they found a 12-year-old girl who was, a, who was there uh, living with her aunt, and she was addicted to drugs. This is what the prayer team did, and, and uh, they were able to get the, the 12-year-old girl to get her out and get her into a safe place, but they talked to her aunt, and they said, would you, like, would you like us to come back and do a Bible study? And the aunt said, yeah, I'd like for you to come back. And so they went back, and they did a Bible study with her, and she invited a friend, and pretty soon they had a group there. And this woman was addicted to alcohol. She was addicted to drugs. She was living as a prostitute. The only reason she was able to be there instead of being in prison was because uh, she had children, and, and so she had a bracelet on her ankle, and she was under house arrest, but the house she, she lived in was just the bridge that was over her head. And she heard the good news of Jesus, and she heard that Jesus can deliver us from our addictions and from our fears, and she put her trust in Christ. And, and uh, you see the picture of her. That's, her name is Lady. That's her in the striped dress, and God transformed her life. And, and she began to have a house church. She was the, 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 the church got her another place to live that was safer and more secure. And life has changed for her. There's power in the gospel. The, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And so it's costly to share the good news of Jesus. And, and it's costly to, to communicate that good news. It was costly for the people from Juan Guillermo's church to go down there and take a risk to be with people that lived in such a desperate situation. And yet when they did so, God showed up. Well, what's our role? Our role is to pray the Lord's Prayer with faith, to say, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. But our role is also to put feet to our prayers and to, to say, I'm going to do something. Uh, I'm not just going to pray. I'm not just going to hope for the best. I'm going to do something. Now, today at, at, here in, in Sanctuary, we're talking about faith promise giving. I'd like to invite you to take out this card, this faith, faith promise card that Nelson showed you earlier. Just take a look at it. Um, it says, faith promise January through December 2016. It says, I or we would like to support missions at Sanctuary. I've prayed over this commitment and have based it upon God's continued blessing upon my life and home. This commitment is between God and me. And there's a place for you to say how you can give from anticipated sources and from unanticipated sources. Anticipated sources means your regular income. I'm going to give generously. The reason that the gospel is on the move, the reason that, 
that um, so many people are coming to Christ around the world today. The reason that Lady knows Jesus and her life has been transformed is because people have lined up with God's purposes. God, by His Spirit, has moved people, and people have responded in faith and in sacrifice. It's always costly to share the good news, but people are paying the price, and we can be a part of what God's doing around the world, and that's why at Sanctuary we do faith promise giving. And, and again, the two sources. We can give from anticipated income, just from our regular salary or regular sources of income, or we can, and in addition to that, we can trust God to provide through us for, through unanticipated sources. So when you look down at the bottom of the card, and there's a place to fill in from uh, the, the sources where it might come from, and there's a place where it says $60. I just want to say, if you've never trusted God to provide money to you from un- unanticipated sources, this is your year for a new adventure. If you've never invited God to provide money through you from sources that you can't foresee or anticipate today, this is your year for an adventure. I just hope that nobody who's here today, uh, when come the first Sunday in December, fails to write down at least $5 a month from unanticipated sources. All you got to do is watch and pray. You don't have to give if God doesn't provide, but when God provides income that you weren't expecting... Uh, you give what, what you trusted him to provide. Just watch and pray. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to go out and beat, uh, drum up business. Just watch and pray and let God provide through you. It's always costly to share the gospel with people, but as we give through faith promise giving, we have a part in, doing, in, in participating in what God's doing around the world to draw people groups uh, to himself, and he's doing it in a great way, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen for free. It happens when people decide to line up their will with the will of God and to line up their pocketbook with the purposes of God. Faith promise giving at sanctuary is a way that we can, can be co-laborers with Christ and, and serve him. Romans 10, verses 11 through 15 says... As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For though there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who, come, who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent. Another way to ask that question, how can anyone share the good news unless uh, they're willing to pay a price and unless they have somebody standing behind them who's willing to to pay the price? And so as we give in faith promise giving through Sanctuary Community Church, what we're saying is, I'm willing to send people. I'm willing to send people to share the good news. And the world we live in today is full of hungry people who will respond if we only send messengers of the gospel. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so it's a beautiful thing when we join together to share the gospel around the world. And it's a beautiful thing when when lives are transformed God is at work around the world bringing Muslims to himself, bringing Hindu people to himself, bringing Buddhist people to himself, bringing animists and secular people to himself, and we need to be at work as well. We are co-laborers with Christ. We are investors in his kingdom purposes. May God speak to you very clearly about your part in faith promise giving, and may you be bold and courageous, not shrinking back in fear, but bold and courageous to say, Lord, I will give what you call on me to give. I will trust you for resources that I can't even anticipate now, and when you provide, I will give them that the kingdom of God may expand on the earth. And so when you pray, 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. When you pray, thy kingdom come, you'll have the joyful um, sense and the joyful uh, realization that you are not just praying vain words, but you're putting feet to your prayers and you are cooperating with Christ in his kingdom purposes. Our Father's love for us is great. The worship team's going to come and lead us in a song now. We're going to have a time of communion and the Lord's Supper. Let's reflect on the great love of God. Let's reflect on being a member of the family of God. We call it communion because we're in this together. Uh, Let's reflect on his love for us and what he did to purchase our salvation so that we could be a part of the family of God. And in just a few minutes, we'll partake of the elements together.